Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this first webinar in a series of three planned webinars that Eurois is organizing during this period of the public consultation on the revision of the Buildings uh, Directive. The series is going to look at several key issues, uh, starting today with minimum energy performance standards. We will then move on in the next webinar date to be announced uh, to discuss energy performance certificates and we will finish with a look into the question of digitalization and smartness in buildings. The whole series uh, is being held under the broad title of Future Proof the EPBD, Let's Deliver Beyond the Renovation Wave and today we intend to take a deep thinking around minimum energy performance standards. I'm Adrian Joyce, and I'm the Secretary General of uh, Euroace. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all on board. Just for immediate information, the session is being recorded for future dissemination. But for those of you that don't know, uh, um, uh, or who may be coming first time to one of our webinars, we ask you to keep your cameras and your microphones off throughout the whole webinar. It is only uh, my, myself and the speakers that will stay unmuted while we're speaking. And after the three presentations, uh, we will have a time with you, hopefully 20 minutes, for a question and answer session. But please, ahead of that session, don't be shy. At every moment throughout the uh, presentations, type into the chat box any questions that you might come to mind. I will then sift through them to be sure that I can uh, pose them during the question and answer session in a dynamic way, I hope, to bring interest to the session. If time doesn't allow and there are extra questions, we will circulate them to the uh, speakers for later responses. And yes, uh, the PowerPoint presentation and questions will be shared at a later date. And for those of you who don't know us, Euroace is a European industrial association. We have 15 member companies. Their logos are shown here. They provide the materials, equipment, services and controls that go together to make a highly energy performing buildings. Uh, between them, they employ more than 220,000 uh, people directly at more than 1,100 production and office locations in the EU. Our main objective in Eurowaste is to improve the energy efficiency of buildings and reduce their energy demand in the most cost-effective manner, because we believe this is the best way to create employment and secure economic growth, particularly in the recovery period ahead. We believe it's the best way to provide Europeans with comfortable and healthy homes that have become so much uh, a center of our lives in the last year and will remain so, I'm convinced, in the years to come. It's the best way to meet carbon reduction targets. Uh, energy efficiency measures enable an easier transition uh, of the energy sector. And by having a less uh, and a much lower energy demand, we increase energy security because we can diversify our sources more readily. One key action of, renovate, of Euro Waste that I'd like to mention is the Renovate Europe campaign. Uh, which is a Euro, an EU-wide political communications campaign that today has 47 partners, including 18 partners at national level. Our focus here is on highly ambitious energy renovation of the building stock. We're asking for an 80% reduction by 2050 as compared to 2005. And we're happy to say we have very high political support uh, with our champions together for renovation. Pascal Confin, the French member of the European Parliament, chair of the Environment Committee, is shown in the image. So last thing on my uh, introduction about the organization, in the Renovate Europe campaign back in 2019, we held an exhibition of best practices. That exhibition is now available to see and browse online with additional information on best practices for deep energy renovation in Europe. So today, the topic uh, is going to be minimum energy performance standards, which I will call MEPS from now on. And 
it may be no surprise, but the topic of MEPS is a truly hot topic in the buildings community here in Brussels. As we're expecting the European Commission to include provisions on MEPS in its proposal for revision of the Buildings Directive in December of this year, we're excited. We're excited because many of us believe that obligating deep energy renovation will be the only way to ensure a significant increase in energy renovations in the short term. But those obligations will have to be underpinned with the right implementation framework that provides technical and financial support to building owners in their journey to deeply renovating their buildings. And we will look at that in our topics uh, today. And I'm absolutely delighted to let you know we have three leading experts to lead us through uh, this topic this morning. The first speaker will be Jonathan Volt from the Buildings Performance Institute Europe, who has broad experience in buildings related research which has given him a strong expertise in MEPS and their place in motivating action. That will, he will be followed by Louise Sunderland of the Regulatory Assistance Project. Uh, Louise is a researcher, advisor and policy analyst whose perceptive work on MEPS puts her, in our opinion, at the forefront of the debate we're having on the topic. And our third speaker will be Françoise Refaber of Energie Demain from France. She is a consultant whose experience in financing and in the provision of technical assistance through one-stop shops ideally places her to describe the kind of practical support that would be needed in the market to ensure the success of MEPS. So during the webinar, as I said, uh, we will hear from the three speakers. I'm delighted to say we're now 65 people on the webinar. And after the speakers, I will moderate a discussion both between our panelists and taking questions from the chat box. But again, throughout the session, please uh, load up the questions in the chat box. Give me plenty of uh, homework to do during the presentations to get uh, a lively debate going. And finally, a reminder, please stay muted and keep your cameras off throughout the whole session. And I remind you again, the session is being recorded for later dissemination. And yes, the PowerPoint will be available to registered participants. So without further delay, I want to give the floor to our first speaker. Jonathan, over to you. Just say next slide when you need me uh, to uh, move forward. All right, thank you, Edwin, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I think we can go to the next one because uh, you already introduced me. I'm Jonathan from BPA. I work quite extensively with, with MEPS the last year, and I'm grateful for being here today to really provide uh, the visionary, the, the, the grand scheme of things, and, and yeah, to, to maybe explain the inspirational parts of this and, and where to start. I will start with the, with the long-term renovation strategies. So my presentation will really be on on the relationship with the LTRS and, and the MEPS and, and how they interlink. Um, and I think we, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I said, I, I will start with the, with the LTRS. And my colleagues at BPA, they conducted two brilliant um, evaluation of the LTRS during the last year. Um, the first one looked at, uh, or first one was a compliance analysis in which they basically checked if, if the submitted long-term renovation strategies, if they comply with the EPPD requirements. Um, the second one, which is more interesting for, for today's chat, was an ambition uh, analysis in which they tried to answer the question, are the national long-term renovation strategies fit for 2050? So do they set out the target and ambition and a reliable roadmap to get there um, in, in these strategies? And I think if we go to the next one, I, I think you all have a feeling what the answer will be. And what it showed was that only four out of the eight that they uh, could analyze, because not all uh, strategies were submitted when they did this uh, uh, research, but four out of eight, so 50%, had a um, uh, decarbonization target over 90%. And I think given given I mean, given the EU targets and climate targets and so on, I think it's clear that this, this figure really must be close to 100% by, by 2050. Um, and so it's clear that 
there, there is a gap in, in, in the target, but at the same time setting the target, that's the easy part, coming up with, um, with good policies and, and, and measures to really achieve this target, that, that is the more difficult part. And, and that is where we come in, into MEPS. And if we go to the next slide, I, would just, I just have one slide that I, when I present about this, I include just to make sure make sure I avoid confusion in, in advance. Um, so what is minimum performance standard? So basically, is a regulation requiring buildings to, <coughs> sorry, to meet a certain performance standards by specific time or according to natural, natural trigger points in the building's life cycle? Typically, it's based on energy performance standards, but can also be other aspects such as carbon, indoor environment quality, and so on. Um, in Europe, um, they are most commonly using the energy performance certificate uh, as a proxy to set this minimum performance threshold. Um, and just to avoid confusion, it is not the same as the Article 7 of the EPPD, which talked about minimum performance requirements. Um, so just to be clear. And if we go to the next one, I will come down to what I really want to talk about here today. So what is the role of MEPS in, in in decarbonizing or in reaching a high efficient and decarbonized building stock. And I think it's clear that MEPS role is to improve the worst performing buildings. Um, here you see in this simplified graph, you have time on the horizontal axis and, and the performance level of the building stock on the, on the vertical axis. And uh, the red line is then then MEPS, and as you see over time, it increased in terms of performance. So over time, we increased the threshold. So if we say that by 2025, um, all buildings or all buildings within a segment needs to comply with energy performance certificate label E, and then by 2030, we increase this to EPCD. And, and Again, this is a simplified version. I think MEPS could be could be um, differentiated based on, on building type or, or building ownership, um, uh, and all or maybe also individualized based on building renovation passport and so on, so that build, all buildings comply according to their best ability. Um, but just for illustration purposes. Um, but the other side, the other side of this coin is um, what I write here, the taxonomy regulation, um, which, as you know, define what is a green or, or sustainable building or investment in, in, in buildings. And um, the purpose of this here is to, while the maps improves the worst performing and raising the floor, the taxonomy rewards the best performing buildings in class, so really being an incentives to yeah, to do a deep renovation or renovate from an EPC F to an EPC A or B in, in one go. And then um, you will not just have a better house, but, but you will also have a green building, which um, hopefully will, will be worth more money. And, and there might also be, um, except to the green loans and so on, we might also attach uh, different subsidies and so on to really incentivize investments to make buildings um, to, to be to go beyond the minimum requirement basically um, and I think if we have these two um, thing or these two things in in parallel and we increase both uh, progressively over time I think we can yeah achieve as a, somewhat of a smooth decarbonization of the building stock and one, one final thing I want to say in this graph is that with, with the maps um, I mean we don't want to force people to renovate. The, the beauty of MEPS is that it sends a signal to the market that buildings must comply with, with these certain standards yeah. over time. And of course, and sometimes it, it might lead to that, that we, in the end will force people to, or really, uh, yeah, people will be penalized and so on if, if they don't comply. But the majority of uh, building owners will renovate because of this signal that we sent out with, with the maps and, and taxonomy to yeah, improve the best performing. Um, and I think if we go to the next one, I will just add a long-term renovation strategy milestones on top of this graph. 
And uh, you see, this is where we are now. We have the PPD revision ongoing. Um, and then we have 2030, 2040, and, and 2050 milestones. Um, and my, my conclusion here is that the long-term renovation strategies, the role of them is, of course, to set the ambition. So where should we be 2050, 2040, and 2030? And this is something you saw in the, in the second slide that um, not all member states have, have been able to do sufficiently. Um, but secondly, the long-term renovation strategy reporting is also a, a good opportunity to really monitor the progress. I mean, do, if you see this dotted line, which indicated carbonization, I mean, have we achieved by 2030 the improvement in energy saving in, in carbon reductions that we set out in, in, the, yeah, in the beginning to do? And then the last part is then, of course, if we don't, if we are below this dotted line where we're supposed to be, we need, of course, to calibrate um, the policy mix in, in the long-term renovation strategy. And this can, of course, include MEPS, um, both the ambition level, but maybe also um, yeah, the specifics that I'm sure Luis will talk about later, but um, the monitor and verification part, the, the, the penalty, the, yeah, the penalty of, of the maps and so on to make sure that more people comply and we, we get more savings. And I think if we go to the next one, I have a couple overall conclusions. Okay, so where, where, where do we start? Um, I think the starting point should be to define what is the highly energy efficient and decarbonized building stock and then backtrack how do we get there by 2050. And I think we need to do this both on a European level, on member state level, and maybe also on, on a regional and local level. Uh, to really, I mean, to set out where, where, where do we go, and then we define how we get there. Um, I, I also think the long-term renovation strategies should be the main instrument for member states to identify how best to introduce MEPS, um, I mean, identifying worst performing buildings is, is already a requirement of, of DPBD and, and the long-term renovation strategies. And I think, yeah, I think this is the most suitable instrument to identify where, where do we set the, the thresholds, which kind of build, which kind of ownership groups or building types should move first uh, or, or move to a higher performance level. Um, and finally, or yeah, in the next part, I think the MEPS also should be this designed to directly support the objectives and, and milestones set out in the long-term renovation strategies um, to really um, to really fill the gap um, because already now, I mean, the member states are supposed to ident identify and define a number of policies and measures, um, but in in most cases, I would say these are not enough to to reach a decarbonized building stock by 2050. And I think MEPS, together with, with taxonomy or, and, and other measures, should really fill this gap and make sure that, that we uh, achieve the savings. And then embedding MEPS in, in long-term renovation thinking will make it easier also to link uh, the standard to a wider policy ecosystem, such as one-stop shops that we will hear later about, building renovation passport, as I mentioned, different financial instruments and, and, and measures and, and maybe digital billing logbooks and, and et cetera. Um, and I think embedding all of this in the long-term renovation strategies is of course needed. And the final point, as I said before, um, I think we should use the LTRS reporting to really monitor the progress and calibrate policy measures accordingly. And um, Adrian, I hope I stuck within the 10 minutes. I want to say thank you for, for this time. I'm looking forward to discuss later. And please re reach out if you have a specific question for me and, and my team. Jonathan, that was perfect. A uh, great introduction to the topic. And I'm quite impressed by the graph you presented. I haven't thought about that relationship before between the um, MEPS setting kind of a floor standard and the taxonomy being uh, a ceiling, kind of a squeezed space between the two where decarbonization uh, occurs. And, uh, or put another way, the MEPS as a stick and taxonomy compliance as a, as a carrot. 
so yeah, I'm sure uh, questions are starting to come in already. So we'll come back to these uh, very interesting ideas uh, in the Q&A session a little later. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, uh, Louise Sunderland, whom I introduced briefly earlier. Louise, over to you. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, if we could pop on to the next slide. Um, so that was a great overview from uh, Jonathan. Uh, next slide, please, Adrian. Um, what I'm going to do is have a little bit of, of time to focus on um, where minimum energy performance standards maps are already implemented. As you can see from this um, map, quite a few places. Um, and so I'm going to just do a little canter around the world with you and look at what are the different types of design we've seen and maybe what can we start to learn from this experience, this growing experience in design. So next slide, please. Um, I've reviewed all of these policies around the world um, and uh, from looking at all the different designs, we can sort of formulate about seven different models. And the first thing that tells us, I suppose, is that there are lots of different types of designs. So, you know, I kind of increasingly think of MEPS as a sort of family of policies rather than, you know, one, just one sort of size fits all. Um, so next slide, please. I'm not going to go exhaustively through every one of these seven, but really pick out the ones that I think are kind of most interesting, most relevant, that give us, gives us a flavour of the different uh, implementation types and, and what we can learn from them. Um, so first of all, it's a single standard. Um, and this is probably the most common one used in, in Europe at the moment. Um, and as, as um, Jonathan said, most of the standards in Europe are energy performance standards, and they usually rely on the energy performance certificate. So perhaps the most well-known single standard is the one in the Netherlands, which requires all offices to be EPC, on their A to G scale by 2023. Next slide, please. A development on that single standard is the progressive standard. Um, and I think this is probably the sort of standard that, we're, that we would need to be looking to um, introduce uh, across Europe as a result of the EPBD. And this, I think, very much um, more uh, reflects the, the, the step graph that uh, Jonathan just showed and so rather than just requiring um, you know one standard to be met at a fixed point in time the progressive standard at the point of announcement and this is really important the point of the first regulation already indicates that there will be future incremental increases to the standard so the example we have is in, is in Scotland where privately rented homes must reach a relatively moderate standard of EPCE on the A to G scale this year, but already in the regulation, there's clear indication that this standard will be increased to EPCD um, in the future, and there are clear dates for that um, for that progressive increase. Uh, next slide, please. The third one uh, I'd like to focus on this top line is the deep renovation standard, and we don't actually have a, an example of this standard in implementation, but I do think it's a really important one for us to consider in Europe, given. Um, given the level of decarbonisation we need to achieve really quickly, um, to be frank. And, and um, the idea for this standard, the model for this standard, comes from the French Citizen Convention on Climate. And they have proposed, I should say it hasn't been introduced in, into, into uh, French uh, law, but I think it's a really interesting proposal and one that's worth dwelling on. And they pro proposed to start with the worst performing buildings, so defined by, as F and G on the A to G EPC scale, I should say this is for residential buildings. Um, but in the first decade, those worst buildings must be uh, deeply renovated. So ambitious renovations to meet the high standard of EPCB. Then having completed renovations on those worst performing, the next decade moves on to the next worst performing um, and requires them also to be renovated to the high standard. Um, so I think the deep standards and the progressive standards um, are very interesting uh, in comparison with each other because they both can, can, can enable us to head towards a kind of vision of what a fully decarbonised building stock might look like. Um, next slide, please. Then we have, I'm going to skim over these next two models um, uh, fairly quickly um, the for the following reasons. The, the trigger point only um, standard uh, isn't commonly implemented. So this is a standard where um, uh, compliance is only required at the trigger points normally of sale and rent, so these transactional trigger points. 
Um, the reason I'm going to skim over it is because um, more commonly trigger points are used in addition to the firm uh, dates that we've seen in, in the examples of the standards. So you may have noticed in the Scottish standard that um, the, the, the increased EPCD standard is required earlier for when homes are uh, undergoing changes in their rental contracts and then there is the firm deadline and beyond that. And then second is the measures based standard and um, so uh, these are standards that require physical minimum physical measures so they might be insulation measures heating measures draft proofing and glazing measures um, the reason i'm slightly skimming over these is because i think these are probably um, at least in the form that we see them implemented are probably insufficient with uh, in, in, in the light of the challenge we have in Europe. The reason I say that is that where we see them implemented, they are usually the, the energy performance requirements, the minimum insulation or, or, or heating requirements, heating system requirements, are usually uh, introduced as part of a kind of minimum housing decency standard. So they are quite low level. And I do think that um, uh, you know, without quite significant um, uh, development and, and evolution, these measures based standards as they exist are probably insufficient for the ambition level that we, we need to have in Europe. Um, the next slide, please. And I think this is the uh, most interesting different model that Europe can learn from from overseas. Um, and this is one that is being introduced um, in United States, uh, cities and states in the, uh, the US um, at an increasing pace, at pace actually. A lot of uh, new cities and states are, are introducing these over the last couple of years. And these um, are standards that focus normally on large buildings, so large commercial buildings. Uh, some of them include large, large um, multi-family buildings. And these require buildings below the average energy or carbon performance of the target stock to make improvements. Um, so uh, obviously this requires the um, city authority to have data on the stock, uh, define a, an average or a benchmark below which the uh, buildings must be improved. They normally contain multiple pathways in the regulations that, that buildings can take um, to uh, improve. And the benchmark is then revised every four years or four to five years. So uh, the average will be recalculated by the city authority every four to five years to take uh, into account the impact of the, um, of the standard and then a new standard will be set. Um, next slide, please. And just finally, to um, focus on the renovation target model, uh, because we have an example of it in, in Article 5 of the Energy Efficiency Directive, which requires 3% of the floor area of buildings that are owned and occupied by central government uh, to be renovated each year. It's an interesting model, but I think really important to say that it, it, it is really, I think, most relevant or perhaps only relevant for stocks that are either owned or managed by one um, uh, very active uh, party. Because obviously, as you can imagine, it requires a stock manager to have a very good audit of the stock to uh, uh, decide and assess which buildings will be renovated each year to meet this target of the 3% floor area. Uh, next slide, please. So having looked at all of those different models, all of those different experiences, what are some of the headlines that we can um, that we can draw and then the learnings that we can take? And actually, I think we have learned quite a lot about um, design um, uh, of these of these national uh, minimum standards policies. The first one, I think, almost goes without saying, seeing the variety that we've just seen in the different models that they are a flexible tool. We do see um, METs being introduced around the world in response to lots of different national priorities. So, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, we see METs being introduced um, to form, as I say, decency standards for housing, quite often focused on privately rented housing. Whereas in the United States uh, of America, we see the standards being brought in really to deliver against quite striving city-based um, carbon or energy saving targets. So they address much larger buildings that are, that, are, that are the big emitters. And as a result of those different priorities, we see the maps being designed in different ways. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the second point uh, should probably also be clear um, from, from the examples we've seen is that the, the, the standards are based on the solid stock data and build, all building assessment tools. I don't think it's a coincidence that um, two of the countries in Europe that have the highest coverage of EPCs, and that's um, the countries of the UK and the Netherlands, have both introduced METs based on the EPC. Um, so uh, we know stock data is really important. Um, in, interesting to see in, in America, actually, the, the standards are based at 
based on um, city-based audits or mandatory greenhouse gas uh, reporting that is required for these larger buildings. So, you know, there are many ways in which we can get the data or, or, or different approaches to getting this data to, to base our um, performance standards. Next slide, please. Um, the next one is, um, is I think probably one of the most important for me is that um, we need ambition from the outset um, in these standards to make sure the standards are effective and that we avoid lock-in. And I will turn to the experience from England and Wales uh, to give evidence on this. So the standard in England and Wales applies to a subset sector of the stock. So it's, it's rented buildings, both rented homes and rented non-domestic buildings. Um, but it's also quite an un unambitious standard. So it applies to a small number of buildings, those buildings that are rented, but also below EPCE, which is, which is I think, around 7% of the target stock. So that's not 7% of the overall stock, it's 7% of the target stock. So it, I think very basically, it's a standard that failed to make a big splash. It, it was really not going to affect that many building owners. And also we found that in review of this standard, that local authorities who were the compliance checking authority actually found it quite difficult to find the buildings that were uh, supposed to be compliant. So um, the, the, the standard, because of the small number of buildings, um, was quite difficult to uh, you know, generate a lot of impact from it. But also because it was a low standard, quite unambitious at EPCE, and contained no future trajectory. So it was a single standard, not a progressive standard. It contained no future, future trajectory of increasing standards. So the reviews um, that we've, we've had from the government found that the renovations undertaken to date um, were quite understandably done just to meet the standard. But that has meant they are quite shallow renovations. And there is a big risk there that um, those shallow renovations have locked in cost effective uh, savings that building uh, owners may have, um, you know, with a longer term trajectory uh, set out for them, they may have made deeper renovations that would have been in the long term more cost effective. Uh, next slide, please. And this leads very well onto the next point here, which is the importance of long term signalling. And this really, I mean, I'm repeating now what Jonathan says, but I think it um, deserves repeating, which is that, you know, policies and the minimum energy performance and the policies that I've reviewed, none of them are introduced today and enforced tomorrow. It is just not the nature of the policy um, or, or the tool. Uh, generally, they are introduced bet with between four and ten years between announcement and enforcement. I think you can see from this um, this sort of illustration here that the idea is exactly as Jonathan says. The idea really is that there's a signal created by the announcement that then uh, directs building owners and occupiers into the available funding, finance, practical support, so that vast majority of the renovations are achieved well before the compliance date. Um, and of course, this long lead time enables the building owners the, the clarity and the time frame and the flexibility to make the renovations at the right time for them, for commercial building owners when they're making other investments for households at the right time for the family situation. Um, and I, I will just say, I won't go into details, but I will just say in the Netherlands, I think you've seen a really good example actually of how this long term signaling, good, clear communication has allowed the value chain to really align and scale up and, and, and enable the building owners to comply with their office's standard. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I'm nearly finished. Um, the, just, the, just the last two points here. Uh, clarity and simplicity of design are really important. Um, once ago, again, going back to in the England and Wales standard, it's quite a complex standard. Building owners can apply for a variety of exemptions. There's also a cost cap that means actually that um, for the enforcement uh, authorities, checking compliance is quite difficult, but also for building owners, understanding whether they uh, need to comply or not is also very difficult. And that has been found through the interim reviews. So the clear finding there is the more complex the legislation, the less clear and more difficult to enforce enforce and then very specifically on exemptions i think it really it really is important to say that difficulty for an individual building or individual building owner in reaching the standard should at least lead to increased support not an exemption from that for that building and i think we see the example very clearly from new york uh, in the united states on on this in which uh, the standard applies to large buildings including multifamily buildings but those multifamily buildings where in which there are uh, over a threshold number of low-income units are exempt 
And the exemption is justified on the basis that financially it would be harder for um, the, you know, the tenants or the building owner uh, to, to come together to finance the renovations. But very clearly, I think the outcome of that is that those low income households who would benefit from the renovations most uh, miss out. And also in New York, we are risking seeing an underclass of buildings that are not upgraded uh, being created, which, which clearly um, you know, is, is an undesirable outcome. And then finally, last slide. Thank you, Adrian. Um, finally, and I would say this is last not least, I would, would have put this on first on my list, but actually I think it provides a nice segue into what Francoise is, is going to talk to us about, um, is that METs are firmly embedded in the renovation framework nationally and very importantly, locally. And in my little illustration here, I've given perhaps two of the most important elements of this framework, which is the funding and finance and the practical uh, information and support. But also, I would say within that framework, particularly at the local level, is the outreach and enforcement. So in all of the examples we see of METs, enforcement uh, is, is charged to the local authorities or the city authorities. Um, and, and I think we see a real opportunity there for compliance checking and enabling to come together within this this one kind of local level um, with the local authority. I won't go into this too more because I uh, too much more because I know uh, Francoise will talk to us a lot about um, this uh, local level um, renovation support and one stop shops uh, next. So I will leave it there. Um, similar to Jonathan, obviously, um, all any questions in, in this webinar or, or afterwards, um, very welcome. Thank you so much, Louise, for that comprehensive uh, presentation. And you're going to see in a moment that the chat box is absolutely zinging with questions and challenges. So we're going to have a lively debate, as I had hoped. Thank you to the participants. Um, but before we get into that uh, debate, I would like now to hand the floor to our final speaker, Françoise Refaber, who is coming to us from France. She's Managing Director of Energie Demain. Uh, Francoise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adrian. So um, I, I will be um, talking about one-stop shops, um, indeed, and uh, their relationship with the implementation of the of the maps. Uh, so I'm talking uh, based on the experience uh, we we had through the Orfe project. And next slide, please. Also, the Innovate project, uh, which is um, which uh, is now over and was developed by uh, Energy Cities, and so it was about um, um, helping um, 11, 11 different uh, projects of one-stop shop to develop and roll out. Whereas Orfe project, I will uh, maybe mention it uh, in more details uh, later on, is um, is uh, more centered on the case of France, and it's about um, creating. Um, um, a resource center for the Société de Tiers Financement, third party financings, which are a kind of one stop shops, as I'm going to explain it. And so, um, uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, first, uh, maybe a, a word about what are one stop shops. <laughs> Uh, uh, when it relates to energy uh, renovation. Well, right now they are described in, in the PBD uh, as uh, some accessible and transparent advisory tools. They should play the role of uh, trusted third parties and they should aggregate the housing renovation projects. So I'm, by the way, uh, very much talking about um, uh, residential sectors, the private uh, residential sector, uh, which is uh, where one-stop shop uh, are really uh, active. So, um, despite they are mentioned in the PBD, we cannot say that uh, right now there is a definition of such one-stop shops. The ones which are existing do not correspond to a standardized service offer. And, uh, for instance, there is no uh, such maps, <laughs> for instance, for the one-stop shops, no um, uh, minimum um, uh, thresholds to, for instance, to define a project that which should be uh, uh, compliant with one-stop shop uh, model and so on. So, next slide. Thank you. 
Um, even if there is no clear definition, I, I think that we have, um, well, for the sake of clarity uh, in, in, in the discussion, uh, we, 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 we can distinguish four different business models, uh, which go from a very narrow to a very wide range of service. And so, uh, basically, you have the facilitation one-stop shops, uh, which are really based on raising awareness of the consumers and uh, they provide initial advice to households. Um, so, in my opinion, these are not really uh, what we should focus when we talk about uh, MEPS implementation. It's more the, the following um, categories, which can be um, considered as integrated home renovation services. And basically, we can see uh, two models for those. The coordination model, where uh, the market actors, the auditors, installers um, uh, are gathered. Uh, they are. The, the idea is to 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 bring a marketplace and um, let the people, let the, the actors uh, interact uh, within a network of uh, which is coordinated, for instance, for instance by the local authority. And we have uh, the all-inclusive model, uh, which is uh, rather uh, held by one um, entity. Um, and this entity is directly offering a full service package, including design of the retrofit, uh, selection of the installers, um, and in in case of third party financing, they also deal with the financing. They can act as banking intermediary or they can provide direct financing. And uh, which is really important, they take of the responsibility for the compliance of the renovation. I mentioned also the ESCO type model, which is of course very important, but um, it's is not really a fit uh, to, to to the market of um, of of uh, residential renovations, at least uh, for uh, um, individual um, home, um, well, uh, single family um, uh, houses. We can see uh, some example of ESCO type model in the. Uh, multi-family uh, building stock, but uh, usually what I see is that uh, these examples are very, very heavily uh, subsidized and basically uh, the ESCO type model uh, where you have in addition to what I mentioned, the idea that you have um, the, the savings uh, which are really paying for the whole renovation and the, that they are guaranteed, this appears to be quite uh, complicated uh, in, in the reality. And so, uh, the question is, uh, should, could uh, one-stop shops act as an embedded framework for a rapid introduction and rollout of the, these uh, maps? Well, I would uh, say that um, rapid, <laughs> I'm not sure about that because as I explained, uh, one-stop shops are more concepts, uh, they are examples, they are in early stage of development, uh, usually they, uh, they, they rely on, uh, on, on public support. Um, but yes, uh, the answer, in my opinion, to this question, um, provided we, <laughs> we, we, we take really into consideration that um, uh, one-stop shops are not uh, really, um, you know, in a stable uh, phase of operation, they, they can be seen as a part of the public policies to improve the, the building uh, energy efficiency. And so, uh, yes, they, they should be an embedded in a larger uh, set of measures. Next slide. Um, this is uh, where they uh, can really be um, effective and um, my view is that uh, right now the business model of the one-stop shops 
they really need to to rely on public su support and so they should be considered as uh, a way to implement maps and more generally speaking uh, the energy uh, efficiency uh, political objectives and so um, they they should for instance uh, uh, be implemented in in uh, national frameworks for retrofit quality control checks and uh, the eco conditionality of subsidies and uh, make uh, basically uh, the credibility of the quality of the renovations not only the energy performance something uh, really um, felt by, by the people basically they should be um, in my opinion the the the, the bottom <laughs> Uh, to uh, the bottom line of, of, of the, the set of these um, political measures. And um, regarding specifically the, the minimum energy standards, I think that if um, one-stop shops are uh, set up at, loc at local level, they can help to take into account the significant disparities between housing typologies and they should allow to take advantage of cases where the potential of energy savings is very high and they then can compensate for the most uh, the more difficult cases uh, since they could act as an aggregator uh, so, so really uh, this is uh, really consistent with um, a, a local approach in in my opinion so uh, this is for my um, my answer uh, to, to 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 this first question and so um Adrian, maybe if if you if you wish, we can start the discussion, and I can come back uh, later on on the OFE project. Or if you prefer, I can just uh, uh, can take two minutes more to explain uh, what we are trying to, to to do right now with the third party financing uh, in uh, companies in France. I think we should take the third party financing uh, right away because it's going to be a very lively, possibly controversial discussion in the panel. So rather finish the presentation, Francoise. Thanks. Yeah. OK, thanks. So next uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, so basically, um, the existing third party financing companies, which are um, uh, showed in, on, on this uh, map of France, are uh, right now seven. They are at a different stage of development. Some uh, the, the the most well known uh, Ile de France Energy and uh, Eau de France Past Renovation and Octave have been implemented from uh, six to, to to three years now. And uh, the, 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 the newer ones are Arte, uh, Bordeaux Metropole and uh, Arec in Occitania region. And so basically, um, the, the, the four first um, uh, third party financing have been um, uh, gathered to, 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 to propose an H2020 project called Orfe for Office uh, for renovations and financing for energy efficiency and it is about um, implementing a resource center to strengthen the third party financing companies and so um, if we can go to the next slide Yeah, basically the idea is that um, if we only focus on, on uh, the relationship uh, between the company uh, which actually uh, may be a public public company huh? uh, for instance it's the case for uh, in Eau de France and in Occitania um, then you, the, the, the difficulty is that we we, we really need to to implement um, over um, over tools or over uh, developments that are uh, more consistent based on uh, um, uh, rather a national approach or a multi-regional approach and so uh, for instance the, the, the online tools the training communication etc has to be uh, developed uh, at this stage and what is really um, 
interesting to see uh, right now in France is how this uh, can be implemented while the state and the agencies of the states are also developing their own uh, policies which are more, more developed uh, in order to reach the local hubs um, which are called in, in France right now the les, les platforms de la rénovation énergétique. And so um, we, we, we see that uh, this set of policies, when it comes to implementing them in reality, there are plenty of challenges and, and, and difficulties uh, to, to, um, to overcome uh, when it comes to, um, to, 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 to being consistent um, with the development of, of the regulation and namely, uh, yes, the maps and um, the implementation of the, the passport, which is also, um, uh, which also just appeared in um, a, a new uh, project law, which is um, presently uh, discussed at the parliament. Um, so uh, in, in this uh, evolving, um, uh, in, in, in this in evolving context right now uh, of a project and the, one, uh, the, the third party financing projects, what are they doing? They try to focus on issuing uh, quality guarantees for the homeowners, um, which is um, applicable uh, for a long, long term period after the completion of the energy retrofits, not limited to 10 years uh, as uh, it is uh, already uh, uh, compulsory by law, but uh, more thinking about 20 or 25 years uh, duration for this kind of guarantee, and to strengthen the, the financial uh, structure of the third party financing companies, um, which, uh, which is uh, quite, um, yes, it's an ongoing subject because uh, right now, um, if I come back to, to the proposals at, at the national level, La Caisse des Dépôts, the La Banque des Territoires, uh, just uh, issued a, a report where they propose um, to set up a national um, banking body, which would be um, responsible for delivering long-term loans for renovations for uh, people who cannot access to, to the to, to the um, banking um, offer. So we see that uh, this objective of Orfe um, can maybe um, be linked to, to this uh, new proposal and uh, really um, it's, it's a matter of uh, discussing with a very long, a very large number of uh, actors at the moment. Um, so th this is basically what I wanted to 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 explain and uh, let you know about uh, the example of one stop shops. And uh, in a nutshell, what I would say is that uh, working on, on the implementation of, of this kind of service is uh, making you really think on uh, how it is possible to make people uh, want to make a renovation because if you only uh, talk about maps and even if you explain that it's a long-term um, uh, prospect and that people when they understand what is an EPC and uh, that it should be uh, B uh, rather than uh, F for instance, they, it's difficult for them to, to go further or to even uh, consider that uh, they would be um, uh, concerned about uh, the, the, the next target coming uh, five years later, later and so on. And so, yes, uh, it's, um, it's I, I think that MEPS cannot work uh, alone. It has been said already by Louise, and I emphasize it. And uh, whereas when you talk about one-stop shops, they cannot really work at local level unless they are uh, included in this um, all set of um, of tools and uh, regulations. Thank you, Francoise, for that uh, uh, view on the role of one-stop shops in in um, in rolling out maps uh, moving forward. I think the message is very clear that actually there are challenges across the board, and uh, good ideas need really uh, substantial support, both technical and financial. So, thank you to the. 
uh, three speakers and thank you to the audience for already being highly active in the chat. You've given me the homework I'd asked for. The plan now is to go through some of these questions and tackle the issues with the panelists. And um, I will run over the hour. Uh, we, we had scheduled internally to possibly go on to 11.15. So let's see how we get on. And I'm going to come uh, maybe first to Jonathan and then Louise on a question that's peppered through the chat uh, box, but maybe best uh, captured by the following question from Stefan Arditi. He says, uh, the question is, the ambition of MEPS is a crucial issue beyond the obvious interest of the tool. What ambition versus our carbon budget should be set? Can we aim to zero carbon buildings for renovation as for new buildings through MEPS? Are there risks to setting progressively increasing MEPS as renovated buildings will not be renovated twice? And Jonathan, you'd already indicated a wish to address this question. So over to you, Jonathan, and then I'll come to Louise. All right, thank you, Adrian, and thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, I think I think the ambition, and that, that is why I talked so much about the long-term renovation strategies. I think that is something that needs to be defined, of course, first by, by the EU, but, but then by the member states. I mean, um, how much energy demand do we need to increase by by 2050 to be able to have like a green um, energy system that is based on only renewables? Um, and I don't agree with this. Um, the questions on, on the progressive enforcement, uh, which I showed in my graph, where we where we have different steps where we start maybe with EPC E as they as we explained they done in in the UK, and then, then we increase it to EPCB or, or current EPCA by, by 2050. I think it doesn't favor step-by-step -step renovations, rather the opposite, because it shows you that by 2050, your building, your building really needs to perform at this level. And as was said in, uh, in, in the comment, you don't want to do uh, five renovations in the next 20 years because, I mean, it is a hassle and, and it will be more expensive even if you do it without locking in your effects. So, so if you can do it, especially if there are subsidies, if you have innovations that, that promote this, if you can do it in one step, I think most people would favor that approach. Um, and yeah, I, th I think I'll leave it to Louise and maybe come back later if that's okay. That's okay. Jonathan and Louise, would you like to come in? Because, But I would like to supplement that larger question with another one I see from Alfonso Fernandez, Man Manuel Al Alonso Fernandez, who says, do you see the risk that setting high command and control requirements on MEPS and deep energy renovation, 60% efficiency, could ultimately become a barrier for some segments, for example, low-income households? in the sense that some owners may halt any renovation if it is too costly for them, while less ambitious renovation requirements could be feasible for them, but are prevented from regulation. Uh, but maybe, Louise, you would come in on, the, on, on those two aspects. I think they're linked. Um, yes, thank you. Um, they're big questions, aren't they? <laughs> so uh, trying yes, to take, I mean, the first one, you know, really, I mean, it, it really is, is on the money, isn't it, this question about ambition? Um, and I think I very much agree with uh, Jonathan in what he said that it, it does need to be set um, at member state level. Um, and why I say that um, is, is, is something to do as well with, with whether we're using minim, minimum energy performance standards as energy performance standards or, or carbon performance standards. And of course, there's a difference. Um, and so I think depending on the design of the, of, of the policy um, and obviously the, the uh, carbon intensity of the um, of, of the electricity and, and the heating fuels mix in, in a country, we would need to go at, to different levels at different speeds. So I, I think we need to think very clearly about the, 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 the standards that are relevant within each country's over time and also um, uh, uh, and, and also, as I say, whether, whether we are defining the standard as an energy performance, so we're looking at reducing uh, energy use or a carbon performance. Um, and I think that is quite a live discussion at the moment. Most of our energy performance standard uh, certificates in, in Europe look 
primarily at energy performance. Some of them also have a carbon performance element uh, or, or, or um, uh, label alongside, but I think that needs to, to be addressed. Um, Lock-in, I, th I think we, ha we have covered, and I agree with everything that um, Jonathan said, that um, it, I think if building owners are given the long-term signal, this is really what we're missing at the moment, is that there is nothing to tell building owners that you are part of this, you need to be on board with this, that your building will have to play its role in decarbonizing and averting a climate disaster. We have nothing really that communicates that well at the moment, and I think MEPS can step in and do that. As someone that is coming towards the end stages myself of a, of a renovation, my renovation has taken me nine years already and I'm not there yet. <laughs> so, um, you know, I would have loved to have done it in all, all in one go, but I do think the practical reality um, for a lot of people is that, that it happens as you do up your home or it happens at different times that, that, that fits with you. And I think we need to be aware of that pra practical reality. Um, high standards is a barrier to some um, uh, building owners, particularly low income. I think two things to say here. Um, this is where once again support, 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 support comes in. Um, I do think we need to move away from the idea that uh, our innovations need to be cost effective in this very limited definition of cost effectiveness that we have given ourselves. I do think we need to value renovations for their social uh, benefits that we have, the much broader social benefits of, of the decarbonisation um, uh, value that they give. And therefore, I, I feel very strongly, particularly for the lowest income households, that we need to be providing um, public support. Um, and and I, I feel very strongly that that, that is the first um, that is, that is the first go to to make sure that ambitious standards can be reached by all. Thanks, Louise. I think that's a good segue to bring Francoise into the debate um, because uh, the question about affordability is coming up in the chat. Uh, Louise just mentioned support. Francoise, you're a, you've been an expert in financing energy efficiency for uh, some time. And I see a question to all from Frank Klinkenberg, which may uh, look to this question, which is, MEPS looked like a really interesting idea for renovations in need of much more exploration to see how these could work in the complex reality of existing buildings. Shall we organize a war game to try out how MEPS could be set up effectively? Um, and I think that's linked because uh, other questions are asking, do one-stop shops help go to zero if you have a, uh, an owner who wants to do the full level um, uh, go to zero in one step? Can a one-stop shop be truly helpful? Uh, so, Francoise, on financing and support, uh, uh, what would you say to some of those comments and questions in the chat box? Yeah, um, so this is a, a tough question. I mean, um, of course, uh, if, if people uh, uh, have low income, uh, they're proposing them uh, a loan, uh, it must come on top of um, of subsidies. Uh, that is very clear. Um, but at, at the same time, what we see is that um, some people would be willing to 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 implement a renovation, and uh, when they go to to the banking market, uh, contrary to to to. Um, uh, social landlords or to um, public authorities, generally they are uh, offered um, duration, of, uh, loan duration, which are uh, in the range of seven to ten years max. So basically, I really think that uh, here there is something to do uh, to um, broaden the, the, the duration of, of, of the loans. Uh, this is uh, something uh, I, I'm pretty sure about. And in addition to that, uh, what we see is that uh, if you take into consideration uh, the energy um, the energy savings that are possible, and uh, then it, it 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 brings the possibility to 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 widen uh, the 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 number of people who are able to to take a loan. Okay, but uh, that being said, it has to be uh, done cautiously because of obviously uh, the, the the objective is not to bring people into um, you know over indebtedness, and this is uh, really the the challenge uh, which uh, the third party financing company 
companies have been uh, tackling uh, i mean to 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 propose um, to people to go into debt uh, in a way which is different from from the banking uh, sector so um there are other ways to make uh, the, the renovations uh, affordable. It is indeed to to to, to perform them uh, by steps. But I agree with the comments, which are that uh, you you don't have to lose the trajectory if you propose this to to the people, and uh, this is where the, um, the the EPC is not enough, and you have to go from EPCs to um, to 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 uh, building passports and um, this is where uh, third party financing uh, companies can uh, yes uh, bring a certainty that the, the first step will be uh, managed in view of the second step and possibly the third step but uh, no more and uh, that uh, there is some infrastructure to 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 let know um, the the successive uh, owners uh, about the, 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 the works which have been already performed and remains, remain to be performed. So, um, basically, um, when it comes to, 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 to lending and, and to, uh, to finance, um, I, I think that it's uh, once again uh, an approach where you you discuss with the people, you see what they want to do and if they are re really willing to go into debt, which is a, a key um, factor. And that um, explaining this to banks is uh, very complicated. Uh, actually, it's not, um, it's not something that uh, they are keen to do and uh, they have other regulations and objectives to, to, to to sustain and so basically it's not uh, their business I would say and, and this is why um, experiences like the third party financing projects in, in France but also other projects uh, which are popping up um, uh, in other countries are really uh, key uh, to consider. Great, thank you Francoise. Um, we're slowly coming towards the end of the session, but I see a question to Louise from Jules Cordillo that uh, opens the question of um, non-residential buildings, and maybe that's worth uh, addressing. Louise, the question reads, the reference, your reference to the French Citizens Convention is interesting. However, what about existing MEPs in place, such as the French Tertiary Decree, which sets obligations for non-residential buildings to reduce their final energy consumption by 2030, 2040, and 2050. Uh, it seems a very good example of MEPs already in place, which can be monitored through the LTRS. Uh, what's your opinion of this uh, approach uh, from a MEPs perspective? Louise. Thank you. And um, that is a really good example, and I apologize for missing it out. Uh, so thanks for bringing it up. Um, I think, as I say, it's it's a really good example. My um, just in in practical implementation, I think my my one question around that is um, how easy is it to communicate uh, uh, with building owners? Obviously, the EPC, you know, we have a, a framework of assessments and setting up EPCs and and, and the EPC. Uh, I accept there's a whole separate conversation going on about the need to improve EPCs and their robustness and the data, but um, the label can be used to prove compliance. As I understand it, the, the French standard requires um, increasing percentages of energy uh, savings to be achieved over the decades. Um, my question is, uh, how, how easy is that to kind of uh, communicate to building owners and then for building owners to prove? Um, and now I, I'm not familiar enough with the with the French um, uh, environment to know whether there is already a kind of set up reporting requirement that would that would very e easily be used for building owners in France to prove uh, compliance with those uh, thresholds of energy savings that, that need to be made over the decades. Um, so that's my one uh, uh, question about that. But yes, I think that, that example definitely fits into these kind of more sort of fleet, fleet standards, I suppose, like the, similar to the, the last two uh, models that I, uh, that I showed. 
Um, and as you say, relevant, I think, to perhaps larger buildings where um, perhaps we already have in place, like they do in the States, the mandatory reporting on energy use or greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just ask one last question because it will be a segue to our next uh, webinar because a number of uh, people in the in the chat have been questioning the base uh, to base the question question whether it's wise to base uh, MEPS on the energy performance certificate framework, uh, given the diversity and the multitude of method methodologies used for EPCs. Um, and maybe with that thought in mind, the best way to bring our discussion to a close would be just to go through um, uh, the speakers one by one and uh, maybe give your last remarks as well. So I'll come to Jonathan first. Uh, a good basis, EPC uh, labeling for MEPS and any closing statement. Jonathan. All right, thank you. I think, I mean, I've worked with EPCs quite a, a lot in the past and I know all the flaws that people point out, but at the same time, I think it's the best proxy we have to identify the, the the performance of, of the buildings um, that might not be true for for all countries, of course, um, in Europe. But I think still, um, at least for for residential buildings and smaller buildings, I think it's the best instrument we have to to set this proxy. And I also think it's it's an opportunity for us to further improve the energy performance certificates and make sure that they also disclose the the, the actual consumption of the building and as well as the, the carbon and, and maybe comfort aspects as well. Um, closing statements, I, I think thank you for, for inviting me and it was very interesting to hear the other, dis, uh, other presentations and, and take part of the discussion in the chat box. So, so thank you again and uh, looking forward to, to, the, to the next webinars. Thank you, Jonathan. So Louise, your turn. Um, thank you. Uh, so on EPCs, I think I just agree with everything Jonathan said. It, it's what we have. Um, and, I, and I was on a, a webinar with um, the Australian government some months ago. And, and um, you know, from, from an outside of Europe perspective, actually, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of jealousy, I suppose, that, that we have in place this system. Um, and it's taken us decades to build up. And I suppose if we weren't to use the EPC, uh, my question would be, what else? Um, and I'm very open to discussions about what else. But um, what I don't want to do, I think, is you know waste another decade putting in place the measurement, labelling and, and monitoring or, or reporting framework uh, um, before then we can start getting on with the renovations. So that's that's my, my biggest concern, I think, um, around that. But I completely agree that, that we need to we need, need a lot of improvements to the EPCs. And I also think building renovation passports, particularly to address this question of lock-in, will be very, very important to communicate to building owners you know, exactly what their trajectory is. Um, final points, I just really want to restate, I think, for me, uh, in the next few years you know the most immediate things that we need to do is of course build up um funding and finance provision and the local one-stop shops uh, and and practical support to to building owners and occupiers and the and the renovation programs in every single country in every single community i think that's um absolutely should be our focus in in the next uh sort of five five years to really build all that up so that building owners have access to these essential services that um that francois was describing and also i think the second point is is to, to absolutely make sure that we have dedicated and i think probably European funds to enable um, those in society who are less able to afford a renovation, you know, to take part and to make sure that they benefit. Um, so, and I, I really think this is something that we need dedicated European funds for a renovation uh, fund that's targeted on low income, energy poor, and vulnerable households. Great, Louise. Thank you for that. And finally, over to Francoise. Um, I mean, are EPCs well understood by? building owners and do one-stop shops help uh, raise that awareness? Uh, are they a quality instrument, Francoise? And then your final comments. Yeah, 
Well, re regarding EPCs, I, have, I fully agree with uh, what Louise uh, just said, so I, I will not um, uh, re uh, rephrase uh, her. Uh, in addition to that, I would mention that, uh, for instance, in France right now, uh, the EPC is uh, being refrained and, uh, in, in the new law I was uh, mentioning, and what uh, will uh, make it very different from the existing EPC is that it, it will be uh, binding uh, on the seller. And so this makes uh, big changes and make the, make, will make the people uh, who provide the EPC um, uh, much more responsible. They, they will be, uh, their responsibility could be uh, uh, sought by, by uh, people who would have been uh, misled by the uh, wrong EPC. So this is uh, really uh, changing the game. And uh, in addition to that, it will be compulsory to, to include in the report of the EPC um, um, measures uh, which have to be implemented to reach uh, a certain target. So, uh, in a nutshell, what I want to say is that uh, indeed you have EPCs and EPCs, and within one country, uh, you can uh, once the EPC is uh, on place, uh, then in, improve it. And uh, so, uh, it, it's really important to to be really. Uh, um, aware of the details, uh, we, we cannot blame the EPCs uh, as a global thing. Uh, you, you really have to be specific about that. And yes, uh, the one-stop shop can uh, implement the EPC. Actually, they can. Um, my, my opinion, if we come back to to, to the very uh, inspiring um, uh, chart uh, shown by. Um, uh, um, Sorry, uh, shown by um, I don't remember the name. Sorry, of um, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, Jonathan, sorry, uh, the, the, the graph shown by Jonathan with the steps. I think that the one stop shop are the one uh, to lead the people who are below the, the, the red uh, steps to go uh, by the, the green steps and, and above uh, actually and take advantage of uh, doing a refurbishment to, to do it as uh, best as possible. Great, Francoise, thank you so much. So, um, with those closing statements, uh, our event comes to a close. Um, I want to thank, first of all, my uh, speakers who've been really great at setting the scene. Secondly, I must thank the audience uh, for raising issues in the uh, chat. Um, I hope we addressed them adequately. And I want to thank my colleagues Aphrodite and Ava, who did all the background work in preparing for today. But in conclusion, let me just give you a few thoughts on what we've discussed. Uh, my thoughts would be, there's no dispute that the building sector and the buildings of Europe must reach a highly energy efficient and decarbonized state by 2050. But looking in the chat, I see that there is still a lot of concern and worry about how best to get there. And that's why we wanted to animate this discussion this morning. It seems to us that obligation schemes are going to be necessary. What their design will be is going to be crucial for acceptability. We certainly don't want to have a backlash and further retard the uh, transformation of the building stock. At the same time, I think it's a quite a, a difficult balance to strike between what is acceptable and uh, in the very short term and getting the momentum going to allow us to achieve the long-term goal. And in that context, the EPC discussion we are hoping to, we will be having in a couple of weeks' time, should be highly informative because, as Louise put it, um, what else do we have today to build on that won't take a decade to put in place? Uh, and I think you'll hear that Euroways uh, favours significant improvements to the Energy Performance Certificate uh, framework in order to make it more reliable, more comparable, more understandable, and more motivating to increase desire among uh, building owners to uh, renovate. So with those two or three thoughts, I'm going to draw the event to a close. Once again, thank you to everyone, and do look out for the recording and the PowerPoint, which will be uh, 
circulated in the coming days. Thank you all. Have a good and safe day.